Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Josh Smith Show. Today, I've got my good friend Andy Stumpf on uh, with me. Uh, Andy has a podcast, Cleared Hot. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great podcast. It's one of the biggest ones in the country. Uh, I've been on it a couple times with him, and it's always a cool conversation between us. Uh, he's just a fun guy to talk to, and it was kind of cool to be on this side of the microphone with Andy today. Andy's kind of like one of the most interesting men in the world, quite frankly. He was a Navy SEAL. Uh, like I mentioned, he has the podcast. He's done wingsuit base jumping stuff, uh, set a world record with his wingsuit. Uh, you know, and then, you know, with his Navy SEAL career, he served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and all that. Um, he's just been around and done a lot of amazing things. Um, but ultimately, he, I consider him a friend. He's just a really good person. Uh, just recently here, they opened a Black Rifle coffee, uh, coffee shop in Kalispell, Absolutely beautiful facility. We kind of talk about that in the podcast. Um, I got to kind of watch the struggles just from a, a friend perspective of, uh, of the building of that, of that building and uh, just how much effort they went to, to to get that all put together. Absolute great guy. Uh, like I say, a really, really good friend of mine. And uh, I think you guys will enjoy the conversation. So check it out. You, are you good to go? We're good to go. All right. He I'm said pretty, that, I'm pretty sure we were we we've started this a few minutes ago. So he says that we're good to go, but I'm still like fucking around. With He's you. like yeah. Jamie Junior. He hasn't quite reached Jamie status yet. I mean, I'm familiar with both of the boards that he has in front of him, and uh, all right, they're both I mean, red. Uh, there's a lot of things on there that need to be red, but Andy comes in, you know, professional podcaster, starts just tearing our shit apart. Right I didn't off tear your shit apart at all. You were talking about you wanted to save money on mics. chairs. By not having good mics. <laughs> <laughs> the other chairs I had sitting in here, uh, when I had this table made, it made it a little bit higher. And the other chairs that were sitting in here were, um, it felt like you were, your arms were like up here. The Rogan chairs are worth it. Are they? Yeah. Are they Are they pretty comfortable to sit on for, that must be why, huh? Just extended period of time. Uh, they are ergonomically correct, whatever that means. Yeah. It's supposed to force you into a proper posture. Yeah. So what's it... Uh, What's it like being a small business owner now after a week? How's it going? Yeah. How's it going with the with the new store? Uh I mean we're still building the boat as we're paddling it. Yeah. You know, or building the airplane as it's taken off, depending on what analogy would work for you. I don't have enough time in the saddle to really like we barely have a month's worth of numbers. Right. We soft open February first, grand opening the twenty fifth. I think today is the sixth. So and we switched over our POS system about two weeks ago. You so when I when I came up so for people that don't know Andy just you just opened a, a Black Rifle Coffee store outpost Probably, is what they call them. Yeah, this is more like a castle. It's like uh, a coffee castle. Have you never been around a castle? I've been to a castle. I've been to the top Cappy Castle in. I mean, Istanbul. they're made out of stone. They have like yeah. huge, like little towering yeah, but compared sections. To, compared to most little coffee shops I've been in, yours is like a castle. Okay, it's a. Uh, I it, don't think it shares any of the building material or design of a castle, but I'm with you on that. <laughs> it's it's big, big and fancy. It's big. Um, it's really nice. I don't know if I would describe it as fancy. The first like five meetings we had with the architects, they tried to convince us to make it smaller. They wanted us to do. Well, there's a few things. We looked very hard at a, at a drive-through model. And so yeah. we own a quarter of a city block that it sits on, and we have plans to finish developing the southern side of it for outside use in the summer or winter, I mean, depending on what people are into. Uh, but the drive through would have eaten up most of that, and we couldn't figure out a way where it would actually work within the location and the traffic flow would have been an absolute nightmare. Yeah. It would have been, it would have been a traffic jam, I think, at all times in every direction, and the street parking would have been a mess. So we got rid of that. And then we were looking at the, you know, the, so the brick building is the historic portion. It used to have a laundromat attached to it, which we tore down. Um, and if anybody ever wants to have really fun uh, games that are super cheap with uh, chemical testing, tear down a laundromat and have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say they were very thorough in their soil sampling. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, they use chemicals. That's it's who, who did completely the, what it's about. Who did all the soil sampling? Why did they even soil us? sample the soil at all they sampled the building they sampled is that just a normal process of building a building i don't know i didn't sample my soil 
Well, you also didn't tear down a laundromat that was over the top of it. <laughs> so it's the first one I've ever torn down. I have a yeah. data point of one. And they, before we tore it down, took samples from the inside. After we tore it down, they took samples in the soil, which makes, I mean, it's, it's industrial chemicals. It makes sense that they would look for yeah. leaching and stuff like that. But then we, we moved, it was weird. They dug a huge hole, put a, found a header in, put the, all the dirt back in, compressed it, and then foundationed it out. Yeah. But so that was on the blue sky portion of the build. But the brick building, the historic building, the original ideas from the architect were to have the entire coffee shop front of and back of house inside of that footprint. Oh. Which, I mean, we, thank God, we didn't go down that path. Yeah. So instead, we have about 4,000 square feet of a brand new blue sky build, which I would describe it as modern architecture. I don't know if I would use fancy. I'm not an architect, though. I don't. I don't get to uh, classify them in that way. But it is, it is larger than any coffee shop that I know of in Montana. Um, it's larger than most coffee shops that I do know of. And we were constantly told, like, "Hey, it's going to be too big. It's going to be too big." And then I was looking at the security camera. I was driving back from Bozeman today, and not while driving, while I was stopped getting water. Actually, I looked at it. It's like 45 people, 50 people hanging out there. So, yeah. good luck doing that in the brick building only. Exactly. Well. You know, and maybe fancy isn't the right word, but it's awful damn nice. I mean, it is really nice with the and all that stuff was super fireplace cheap. in the middle. Yeah, it was all super cheap. Well, you can <laughs> actually you can tell you went real cheap on it. Yeah, God. Denver describes it as reasonability, leaving the conversation very early on. Yeah, well, I mean, for the amount of time that it took, and I mean, I I think the first time we talked about it, it was like, oh yeah, we'll be open in thirteen months, and then that's what we were told. Yeah. From what I understand, it's F- like... Start every to finish. How, how long was it? Over two years. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like we looked at PDF documents for eight months. Is it... When you build a, a building like that, is it is it more of a, of a, of a hassle dealing with architecture people and, and, and the design type stuff? Or is it more of like government permitting and dealing with city and county and all the regulations? Yes. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. It, they each had their own unique challenges. They must have lake homes next to each other. And I don't know. So I grew up in a construction family, and I'm relatively used to uh, the permitting process or knowing that the permitting exists. And I think I might have gotten a little bit of a flawed view of it when I was younger because my dad grew up with a lot of the people that he would go to the building department, like the building inspector. He played football with him in high school. Yeah, We never had a hard time getting a building inspection. Yeah. Uh, scheduled. He would not always pass, but... I'm just having fun watching you try and get out of your coat. I was trying to do it quietly. Uh, and then he would... he would. <laughs> now it seems shocking. He would just walk into the building department and go behind the desk and talk to people. Yeah, that yeah. shit does... Nobody gets to do that. I would describe the city that we built in as very close to being anti-new business. Okay. Yeah. It was uh, expensive. It took longer than it should have taken, um, which from what I've been told now is basically just what a construction process is called. Yeah. Like, here's your quote, and it's going to be late and over a budget. That's that's how you do that, and that's what we did for sure. Yeah. It was challenging, though. Um, and then the architectural, it is the first time I've ever built something. Actually, it's the first time I've ever built anything. Um the process of looking at it on a PDF document and actually getting out there and physically being able to see it, you would think it would be very regimented and straightforward. It was anything but in yeah. my experience. Yeah, that's a, you know, I grew up in the es- in the excavation world. So same thing dealing with permitting and whatnot. And it seems like it started to change like in the mid to, well, more like the late 90s, early 2000s. Because same thing when we used to have to deal with the health department for like septic permitting and you know, just our customers dealing with building permits and stuff. It just seems like somewhere along the line there, reason, you know, reasonability just lo- left the room. I don't know if it's because they view it as a pure money-making venture for the city or people who find themselves in those positions really like the perceived positional authority that they have. But it was, it was challenging. Yeah. There, was, there were some uncomfortable conversations with city employees. The uh, the payoff, though, I mean, or I guess the results of it ultimately at the end, though, I mean, for anybody who is 
taken a trip to Glacier Park or whatever, I mean, to stop in at that coffee shop and have coffee, and especially for the local people to, that actually get to enjoy it all the time, I mean, you guys built something, quite frankly, in a part of town that needs revitalized. We um, looked at that, too, when we were looking at the property as to, you know, Main Street, Kalispell has the highest traffic volume in a vehicle, but the absolute worst parking. So we were looking at there because and there are empty spots on Main Street. Um, I don't remember them being as many prior to COVID, but now there certainly are. There's some massive ones where we actually could have built a larger coffee shop. But if people can't get to it or it's a pain in the ass, yeah, I don't think that's smart. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, I I don't know. It's 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 definitely I think going to be a place that's going to kind of be a, a a place where people really come together. I mean, you can tell with with the outdoor space that you put in there. I mean, it's going to be kind of fun to see what, what it's like there in the summer because it's the only place like it down there, period, that I know of. I mean, I don't live there, but um, when I come up there, it sure seems like that's that's going to be the spot, which is pretty cool. I mean, I hope you look so. at the grand opening, there were, well, they filled the store when you guys opened the doors. At, it took an it hour. 5 a.m.? We opened at 5.30, I think. And it was probably 6.30 before there wasn't a line outside. It so, took us an hour before we could close the door. Yeah. On the eastern side. And just the took outside. took three hours to actually unlock the front door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The guy, That's how you do that. Yeah. There was a guy knocking on the front door. and uh, We're I, figuring out I, as I we go. I asked Andy, I'm like, that door open? Yeah, yeah, I think it's open. I'm like, I'm not so sure I it is. I clearly didn't say that. I, I guarantee you I said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. <laughs> no, I hope people in the Valley like it because uh, I've never been more in debt in my life, so it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> well, I mean, those, that shit's not free. Yeah. I mean, that's the gamble, right? You, uh, If you have an idea that you think... For me, it resonated with Denver and I. I mean, that's where it started. The whole thing started with a conversation... In Kalispell, and I forget how we got onto the topic. For the life of us, we both talked about this. We can't remember why we started the first conversation, but it ended up circling around. If you had to go to a business meeting, where would you go? Or if you wanted to go get a cup of coffee, there are a bunch of options, but what if you wanted to get a cup of coffee and hang out for a bit? Right. Where would you go? Right. And we sat there and we noodled on it for a bit, and I and I still go to some of the other coffee shops in town. Like I have, And that's one of the weird things is there's been a... And of course, it's online versus more in person. Oh, I can't believe some big chain store is coming in. I'm like, hey, I hope you don't go to fucking Costco. Yeah. While you're complaining about this, like, or get your gas at a Chevron yeah. or an Exxon or a Conoco or go to Safeway or Albertsons. Like, come on. Like, it is owned by, I've lived in the Valley now for six years, which don't worry. I know it's not enough for real Montana people. Yeah. You, I mean, you're, you kind of single handedly have ruined the Flathead Valley from what I've, I have been told I that. I have been told Rogan, that by posting pictures. Rogan ru- ruined Texas, and yeah, you've ruined Montana. But the, the whole idea was, where would we go? We couldn't answer that in a way that we wanted to, so why don't we build that? Yeah. And there's obviously a lot of steps that go in between, hey, we should build that, between actually doing it to include finding the money to do so. Um. But I think we've, I mean, we've been open for a month. It's probably the slowest time of the year that it's ever going to be. I mean, for people who are listening to this that don't live in Montana or aren't familiar, it's, and I actually don't know how it is in Missoula, but I guess it would be kind of the same. Does the population swell in the summertime? Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, Missoula is a college town, so I'd, I'd actually say. Well, it probably it might decrease. It, it, it actually might decrease a little bit in the, at least downtown. You know, like the bars and stuff yeah. definitely aren't as busy in the summer. But I, I, I would. It's interesting because it's also that's that's when tourist season is. So it's almost like the people Net are neutral. replaced by other people. Yeah. So for us up in Kalispell, not the case. Yeah. Uh, Glacier National Park, I believe, even though they've really throttled the uh, amount of people. Well, maybe they haven't throttled. You the have amount. to have reservations now. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say I don't know if they've throttled the amount of people they can get in there, but they have throttled how you can. You have to go online. You have to buy a pass per day, which mm-hmm. I think. In previous years, you just kind of lined your car up, I, and I and I don't. I'm not an expert on either system, yeah, um, and don't know enough to talk about it intelligently. But what I can say is that it's a palpable difference in the summer. Like yeah. it's just it's a swarm of people, and we wanted to open the winter because we wanted to test not only our business model but the systems behind it as well, and give our staff time to train. But if we can tread water in the winter time, we're going to yeah. be okay in the summer. Yeah, you guys have about two months here. 
You, know? you figure late May. That's normally where I start. Yeah. And I notice it more than anything, just traffic in, in town. And I love yeah. listening to people in Kalispell. This traffic is unbelievable. I'm like, have you ever taken six hours to go to Los Angeles and gone yeah. seven miles? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and Kalispell really s- kind of sits right directly in the middle of a tourist triangle between Flathead yeah. Lake, Whitefish. Um, glacier. You know, and Glacier. It's just, uh, it's like planted firmly right in the center and really Kalispell's where any tourists would fly into to go to any of those places so I'd say it's a 10x population bump yeah it would be my total like back of the envelope anecdotal math yeah well so now that you've now that you've launched the coffee shop and it's up and running um I mean that's consumed I'm sure I can't imagine how much of your time and your thoughts over the last 18 months to two years what what uh what now? I mean, what do you turn in your focus to? I, I saw something on, I don't even know. I kind of partially read it. I was busy, but something with Jack Carr and clandestine You can just say that media. you don't care. That's fine. Well, it's that too. I was trying yeah. to act like I cared, but. I know. I just, we can cut right to the, the meat of the issue. So I'm at the coffee shop every day mm-hmm. because I like hanging out there. It's almost as if we built a place we would want to hang out. So Denver and I yeah. are there every day. And also I will hop in, like I'll go empty the garbage or I'll go clean the bathroom or I'll hop on behind the POS system. I don't mess around with uh, making the food because, well, two reasons. I don't know how and I also don't want to. (laughs) (laughs) But I I want to have an understanding of all of the systems. So when we sit down with our management staff, we can have an intelligent conversation and not one where I don't know what they're talking about. And I want to have an understanding of their job not because I want to do their job. And it's one very hard line for me that I draw is I'm, I want to own a coffee shop. I don't want to run a coffee shop, but yeah, I th- and that resonates because it's honestly turned into somewhat of that, that situation here, you yeah. know, with MKC. I mean, you know, hiring Andrew, you know, from, you know, he's our director of operations now, but like the knowledge that he brought in from Amazon, um, is, is vast. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, and you, you start to realize how much you don't know, but, I want to be involved in things enough to where I can have an educated conversation, yeah. you know, but I also don't want to have to do that job. I don't want to have to do the bookkeeping, but you know, so I, I can totally understand where, but you need to know enough to know, yeah. at least be able to keep track of the tides in the wind. Yeah. And I, for me, I think it's essential from an owner's perspective to understand the requirements of the job so I can further empower the employees. Mm-hmm. Like if I, if there's a, a rumbling of, Hey, we need this and I can hop in there and be like, Oh, I totally understand what you're saying. It makes it an easy sell. If I have an understanding of the requirements of the roles and responsibilities of the people that work for our manager, then we start having a conversation about a human being and there's good performers and poor. And we're already experiencing that we've had, uh, our higher fire rate is great, but we have had to let, uh, people go. And I don't get involved in that at all, but I have an understanding of what their roles and responsibilities are. And I actually, uh, the, most important thing I think we did was the hiring of our general manager and she's been on salary for a year. Yeah. Helping us behind the scenes, whether it's with a prime vendor from black rifle coffee, you know, the wrap that goes in the bathroom hallway, they look like C one thirties or the furniture. Every, every single thing in that store has a story. And by that, I mean, it comes from somewhere with paperwork associated with that, that all terminates and somebody writing a check Yeah, that somebody has to track and manage. So Tanya has been fantastic and, you know, we'll, we'll have, she will inform us about um, both good and um, potential issues that we're having with employees. And I'm glad that I know about that, but I stay out of it. Yeah. I tell people, you know, um, my oldest son just went through and he got hired yesterday. And I told Tanya, I was like, they get no free pass regardless of the last name that they may have. They either sink or swim on their own and please treat them at, cause my daughter works there too. Treat them as you would any other employee, actually give them less slack than you would any other employee. But I stay out of it. And I tell them like, you don't work for me. You work for Tanya. We, we've had the same, I've had the same conversation. My daughter's taken a semester off kind of switching colleges. And so, uh, when she talked to me about coming to work here, I sent her to Andrew and I was like, all, all of my employees downstairs, I all work for Andrew. Yeah. You know, so I made her apply through him. I did the same thing yesterday. He went, did the whole application. He did a interview with our two, our our GM and our AGM. I was not in the room. I actually even left the coffee shop. I was like, hey, let me know how it goes. They talked for like 30 minutes. I went in afterwards and talked to our GM. 
and just said, hey, here are my concerns with him working here. Don't give him an inch. Yep. Same. And I've told all my kids, you know, if, you know, we'll see what happens down the road with the company. I actually hope my kids leave and go do something else for, for quite a while before they want to maybe come back here. But um, if they do want to work in my company, they have to start right from the ground up, just like everybody else, you know, yeah. and, and really learn it inside and out. Um, but yeah, I've told her, you know, you have to approve time off everything you want to do. You have to, you know, and it's actually good cause she really doesn't know him well. So there's a level of a little bit of uncomfortability there, I'm sure. And it's good for, her. yeah, it's, it's really good. Like if um, anybody comes to me at the coffee shop, like, Hey, what do you think about this? Like, You're talking to the wrong person. You need to go talk to Tanya cause I yeah. work for her too. Well, and you want Tanya to take ownership in that yeah. place. And, and if all of a sudden you're cutting her off at the knees, then that's not going to work well. So she's got to feel like she can run it. And, but like you say, you got to have, same with me, I have to have an understanding of what's happening. Yeah. Um, but I want to empower my employees to make decisions. You know? Same. I also just like hanging out there. Yeah. And I enjoy coffee, and it's cool to, like Denver is a coffee nerd, like full-on nerd alert. Yeah. Um, like nerding out over, oh, it's, you need to be using 202-degree water. I'm like, Fucker, I'll go fill up a thing of yeah. ice water and dump it in here just to piss you off. I, I don't thought, care. I thought hot was all the same temperature. Oh, no. We're talking <laughs> thermometers in water within one to two degree tolerance. And if you ask Denver for a cup of coffee, it's going to be about 30 minutes. I don't have time for that shit. Yeah. So I'll go batch brew and just <laughs> pour, just pour it in my mouth. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's all I care about. So uh, transitioning here, what are you what are you doing here with Jack? And Yeah, um, so you were asking me what I'm up to. So the coffee shop, I'm always going to be involved in that. To a degree. Yep. Um, and the cool thing is, it's not like it's really going to, it'll, we'll grow staff wise. We're going to have to for the summer months and as we add the outside area, but the quarter block is not going to turn into a city block. Right. So we'll, I think we'll really get that dialed in. We're just, we just hopped in the saddle on that thing. We need a little bit more time. Find a cruising altitude there. Pretty much. Yeah. We, we, we literally are, you know, building the airplane as it's taken off. Um, so I still have my own podcast, Cleared Hot. Um, like this, this month is insane. I leave tomorrow to go to Boston because my wife Leah is teaching a seminar south of Boston on Saturday. And then in, God, I'm going to mess this up. It's not Providence. I don't know. It starts with a P. Somewhere in Maine. Uh, Portland, Maine. On Sunday, I come back. She stays in New York. Then I go to Chicago next weekend because she's teaching again. So I'm going to go not only participate, but try to also film her as well because she is kind of um, expanding and growing the content and business opportunities for her in the jujitsu world. She's been at it for 14 plus years. She's spectacular at what she does and she spends, she's a full-time coach. Yeah. And then we come back and we're going, um, we have had a vacation plan for six months. Now we're going to go up to Canada and snowboard. So like March is a total wash for me pretty much. Yeah. But inside of that, you know, in, in the time that I do have, so there's the shop, the podcast, um, I'm now again, starting to do a good amount of public speaking. I've been getting a lot of requests recently. And then, uh, the stuff, it's not actually with Jack. So Jack's podcast, Danger Close, is produced by a company called Ironclad. Mm -hmm. He has a relationship with them, and I think he might have come up with the idea of what we're doing now, but it's a, it's a limited series called Change Agents. I agreed to do 25 episodes. So each one of the episodes is either a social issue or an economic issue or an environmental issue or a, just an issue somewhere in the world. Like so we have four already in the can and there's a bunch more ready to go. But the first one was on human trafficking, specifically sexual trafficking of women and children pretty much, which is gnarly. Yeah. Then I had, uh, I did one with, uh, Evan when we were, he was up there for the grand opening talking about veterans transitioning out of the military and the struggles that a lot of people have of being able to put what they used to do behind them and move forward and redefine themselves. Then I talked to a guy who like is an expert in cobalt mining. Yeah. And how, you know, the actual like child labor that's involved in like, and everybody wants, Oh, I drive a Tesla. I'm doing my job for the environment. Like that's right. coming straight from slavery, like right. 100%. But yeah. it's also in all of our devices. And what I loved about that conversation is his idea was not to throw all that away. It's a way to make better choices about those devices to maybe lower the demand signal while some regulatory efforts can come into place. Not that they would necessarily be followed, um, and then the fourth guy I talked to is, you know, he's on a mission to provide clean water to people all over the globe. Still 700 people, uh, 700 million people uh, specifically in uh, Africa alone don't have access yeah. to clean water. So I'm going to be talking to uh, like drug addiction, homelessness, like fill in the blank. 
Each of the episodes, I'll probably talk to him for an hour. That's how long the conversations have been going. Ironclad's going to edit it down into a 30-minute, very consumable, very digestible format, and then release it. So we're going to end up doing 25 of those. Um, and if people enjoy it, I was shocked by I literally put up that picture and the feedback on social. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're following. I mean, we've, we've seen it with just, you know, you've been generous with just sharing some of our stuff or having me on your podcast. I mean, you're, you're following is the most loyal, rabid following that I've, I think I've seen of anybody that we've ever been associated with. I mean, and I, I think it comes through just on the podcast, you know, you're, you're super open, um, and honest. I mean, you, you, you cover a lot of topics, you know, you've talked about, you know, your divorce or your ex-wife and stuff like that and parenting mm-hmm. and veteran issues and, you know, you, you name it, you've kind of covered the gamut, you know, much like how Rogan does, but I'd say a lot different than Rogan. Like you've gotten a little bit more with like the personal side of stuff. And I think people, um, appreciate that. And I think that adds like a depth of, um, realness to it that people think they feel like they kind of somewhat know you, you know, and I know you definitely leave, leave some topics out, um, you know, or some details, but, um, you know, so it doesn't surprise me when you say you put something up like that, that people are, are going to want to jump on that. Cause you know, you've, you've interviewed some of these kinds of people before in the yeah. past. I know the sex trafficking type, um, detectives and people fighting that kind of stuff. Yeah, That was human trafficking just in general with the deliver fund people. Yeah. It, it gets gnarly when you start talking about like young women and men too. It's not, it's not unique to women, but especially overseas, you just would be like, hey, uh, Josh, can you go ahead and make these real sharp for me? I got to go on a quick trip. Yeah. <laughs> I, we had a guy here in the shop. I've tried to get him to do the podcast, but he's currently working for the feds. And, mm. um, you know, I even talked to him. I'm like, dude, if we got to shut the cameras off and just do audio. But, he, he, you know, he doesn't want to get in a bind. He actually asked his boss and they kind of, you know, just politely declined. But, you know, him and his wife both are... Our, our detectives for the feds here and he he does more of the drug side drug yeah. drug trafficking stuff and right now is working hard on like the fentanyl fentanyl crisis and stuff it's like that huge up in Kalispell and it's still, and his boss I think is actually located in Kalispell it wouldn't um, surprise me so I have a bunch of law enforcement buddies who are up mm-hmm. there that's still that and meth are the things that they're dealing with both being sourced from Mexico you would think it would come from the northern border because we're 60 miles from the border in Kalispell but the source cities for, I was just talking about them uh, not too long ago. It basically comes up the coast. Yeah. Um, I believe it's Portland that was one of the main source cities. It comes east and makes its way into our communities. So I-90 I, I right here that's a mile from my shop, you know, that interstate corridor is is the main trafficking route, you know, coming through Montana. And it goes kind of two places. It either heads up north, up into Canada and the oil fields and all mm-hmm. that stuff up there. Or, you know, when they had the oil, fu- oil field boom out in the Dakotas, um, it just it just ramped everything up exponentially, you know, because it's heading right straight across Montana through I-90 into the Dakota oil field stuff. And Are you saying you're more productive on meth in the oil fields? Must be. Stay awake longer, wake, make work longer shifts. They seem to like to dance. I was watching a man who, and I have... <laughs> No ability to judge whether or not somebody's on methamphetamines. However, I'd put a good amount of money that this man was, and he was having a dance party on the corner of the street at about 6 p.m. Well, I mean, you know, if he's in a good mood, I guess it's more people need to dance. I just don't think you can sit still. It seems like they have that uh, desire to just keep moving, or I guess one of the main indicators for people who are on meth is they disassemble things, but they never put them back together. <laughs> really? So a cop can roll up to somebody's house and just be like, bing, I know. So they wouldn't doing. be real good for, for assembly in the MKC shop. They could take your knives apart. More of a teardown situation. Which I don't know why you'd want to do that. <laughs> no. Yeah. But like stacks of VCRs that have been disassembled, never put back together. Interesting. Yeah. Well, with this guy, it's interesting because he was talking about uh, you know, a couple things. So he, he handles all the drug side. His wife does uh, mostly all um, children's dr- uh, sex trafficking, you know, stuff. So imagine that. I was going to say, can you imagine looking at that shit all day? Dinner conversation at night. And he, so she, he said she's actually, and, and she might maybe be more willing to do the podcast this fall because she's retiring this fall. She's hitting her 20 years and she's out. But he, he said it just wears on her super, super bad. Um, you know, he, he did a little bit of investigating when he was in a, in a back east in a larger city and he said he never really had to 
dig into the details of the photos and looking at stuff. It was more of a, he was searching for certain people, Yeah, but he didn't have to, you know, do what she does where she has to get into the nitty gritty, terrible details of everything. And, uh, you know, and he sees enough of that kind of abuse and stuff on the drug side with what he deals with and, and the neglect of children and whatnot. But, um, you know, we were talking a bit about, uh, just, just how, how tough that is on her, but also how much of that happens. You know, you think you're in small, small town, Montana, like, Oh, that shit's not happening here. That's all in Skid Row in LA. And it's like, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And you know, like they were saying, you know, in, in big cities, they have enough detectives, enough agents that they get to do a lot of job trading. So they'll work on something for six months or a year, and then they'll, they'll do something else to just keep from wearing on people. But we're in a small area. And so, you know, they both been doing what they're doing for four straight years, you know, just, but he, you know, they, he has a daughter in my son's class and, um, we, you know, we were talking about how not allowing her to have social media and being scared to drop her off at the bus. And it just like that stress of knowing what's out there. Um, I'm actually glad that I do what I do and I'm somewhat ignorant to just what's out there, you know, keeping your kids from having that stuff is a good idea, but it fails in reality because if they have friends, they just borrow yeah. their friend's stuff. Yeah, if they've ever ridden the bus, they're going to mm-hmm. see and hear everything. Yeah, but or if they're in class with people who have those devices. Um, and I, you just can't hide your kids from the reality of what the world is going to throw at them. Yeah. You, can, you can tell yourself that you're doing the right thing by doing that, but you're lying to yourself if you think it's actually effective. Yeah. And that's not to say you should ignore it and not address those issues, but just because you don't have a social media device on your child's phone, don't think for a second that they don't have access to that stuff. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's uh it's interesting. Rogan had um a guy on that has that uh soft white underbelly channel, that YouTube channel. Oh yeah, I did listen to that one. And I went down that rabbit hole of downloading a few videos and watching and it was unbelievable. Um what, what and I've been saying this for a while, but it was kind of proof of my theory of you know, you can talk about what the government's going to do to change everything or to make things better or whatever, but ultimately um, every single one of these people, Henry, will you turn that off? It just keeps flashing. It's because he's messing with it. Yeah. He's yeah. pushing buttons. He's on his laptop yeah. making that happen. Uh, what if we need to Google something? Well, he can turn it back on, but it just keeps flashing. Uh, what's interesting about that is I've said for a long time that the only way we're going to fix our society is it starts with parenting. Yeah. And every single person that I saw that guy interview, he always starts with the same question. It's always, tell me about your childhood. How was your childhood? I'm assuming the stories were not fantastic. Oh, my God. And, you know, as much of a piece of shit as I feel like, you know, uh, a child molester is, sex trafficking people, whatever, but like uh, like the child molesters, for example, you know, I generally just have this idea of, like, they should just be drug out in the street and shot. Actually, maybe even tortured, then shot. And... uh when you start to hear how those people grew up and they, you know, started being molested and raped from the time they were 18 months old, two years old until they were 23 by everybody in their family, including their mom and sisters and brothers. And, and it's like, not that you think anything more of those people, but you actually start to gain an understanding of like, Oh, I can see why this person is completely fucked up. Or would why that why they would want to be fucked up to detach if that's your reality I would want to detach from that as well yeah and you start to realize that like um, you know one lady was devastated that what she had done because she had gotten caught had gone to prison and then gone to, into basically rehab and somebody had to teach her of like how damaging and devastating it is and now she's at a at a place where she she had just never been around people that told her that wasn't normal it's freaking crazy. Yeah, I agree with you on the parenting front. I don't know if we have an attention span as a country or as a species to allow it to take the time that it would need. The prob- yeah. no, Well, it's not a problem. The challenge with that is it's generational. It's it not is. instantaneous. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't know, given people's, it's like they want to hack everything, right? A hack culture. Four hour work week. Well, how about a three hour work week? How about a one hour work week? Right. You know, the seven minute abs. I mean, it takes time. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem with, you know, all of our election cycles are all run on, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you this, you know, uh, we're going to pass this bill, but none of it is really truly designed around, Hey, this is going to take the next three administrations and two generations to fix, you know? 
I think um, we have a lot more problems with our political system than just the bills they're introducing, but yes. Yeah. I'm not so sure it's a viable system anymore. It's, uh, no, I, I, I agree. The, the problem is, is how does it change? I think um, you have to instill term limits. I think that's one of the first steps you have to take is you can't allow people to live in politics longer than they've been out of it. It should be disqualifying after maybe three terms at most. So, so I, I actually know one of the senators, our, our state senator, John Tester, quite well. I, he was my godfather when I was a little kid. And he's the, in my mind, he's the perfect example of the need for term limits because I absolutely believe when that guy went in, you know, he was just a music teacher and a farmer from Big Sandy. He was what he was. We cut meat, cut our beef every year. Um, truly think he was as, as advertised. Just good guy wanted to make change. But after you've been in that place in Washington for 12, 15 straight years, I think, I don't care how pure and wind driven, you know, pure is the wind driven snow or whatever that you think you are, that place wears on you. And you have to make, you have to make um, choices, you know, um, you know, do I do this or do I do this? And both are a lose lose choice, you know. Yeah. And they start making, uh, I don't know, what do you call it when you make a, uh, Compromise. Compromise. You have to just compromise your values, you know. And, um, yeah, the term limit thing to me. But the problem is the people that need to vote in the term limits are the ones that need the term limits. So. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if uh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard and I are supposed to link up at some point in the near future. And I'm fascinated when I hear her talk about the inner workings of the government. But when you hear her describe the two-party system and how it's completely contentious at all times, and it's just like, okay, Oh, you were voted in on this side of some fucking imaginary aisle. You will vote with us or we are going to absolutely kick you to the curb and make sure you can't do anything. Um, and these people over here are our enemies. When she went when she went against Obama with Syria, yeah. you know, bomb the bombings in Syria that Obama was proposing, that was the end of her political career. I mean, right then and there, they basically just told her this is it. Like from the Democratic Party, I'll be yeah. interested to see what her move is. You know, leaving the Democratic Party, I don't know where she's going to land. Um, I don't follow politics that closely, but it scares the shit out of me when she talks about the establishment and the people who are in power. I mean, just look at the net worth of people pre politics versus post. It's like, come on. Yeah, Nancy Pelosi's the uh, most successful stock trader in U.S. history. She is, <laughs> but there's plenty of Republicans who are also 100%. very good stock pickers. No, and I, 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 I say often, um, I, I'm as equally, you know, when you look at what the, the Republicans had their chance, you know, when Trump got in, they had the House, the Senate, the president. If they really wanted to go make real change then, they could have done it, you know. And uh, unless that system is serving those who are working in that system more than the people it's supposed to represent. I like the idea, too, of I've heard people say, whoever's elected president, you have to choose the opposite party as your your running mate. Oh, and it's a little bit of a flip flop or you have at least representation. At least you have someone in your office that's, you know, like, for example, if, uh, you know, if DeSantis won this year, then he'd have to choose, you know, say Tulsi or which I know Tulsi left that party. But I see what you're saying. That's an interesting at least having. Um, mm-hmm. you know, someone from the opposing side that you have to work with in your office, you know. How about six, eight years tops and you're out? You're yeah. done. Disqualified from further service. Yeah. It was never supposed to be an occupation. I think the idea of two terms is, I think two terms is a must just to keep some continuity going and some experience in there, but t- two terms tops. Yeah. If you're at like four to five decades of uh, politics, sorry. And you look at the politics of what's happening now, um, like with Ukraine and Russia, um, it boggles my mind. We just had the president of the United States land in the middle of a war zone of someone else's war. Like, go visit the, the a war zone. <laughs> what makes it somebody else's war, though? You need to look at how much support we've actually provided to them. Well, exactly. And so I, I won't name the name, but at your grand opening, yeah. our, one of our good friends there is asking him, um, cause he, I think he's back now, but he was headed over there. He was headed over there that day. Yeah. And I asked him, I'm like, dude, what the hell? Like it's, it appears to me as though we are trying to be in war. Like when you land in the middle of a war zone and you're the president of the United States, like you are, you are poking the, those people in the eye, you know, like the Russians. And he said, yeah, we want to be in a war. We're trying to be in, this is one man's opinion. Yeah. 
Um, this man also likes war. It's, it's true. <laughs> Which I don't, I don't blame him for. It's awesome, but... But he, not war as a concept before people take that uh, the wrong way, but actually fighting in a war is from somebody who used to do that for a living. It's like the most beautiful and ugly thing I've ever seen, but yeah, it, it can be awesome. It's interesting because the kind of war that's being fought there is not the kind of war that you fought in. You know, when you see, like I yeah. follow some of these Instagram pages and you see these trenches they're dug into. No, it's like World War I shit. I mean, holy shit. It is truly... Like we're watching World War One in color, um, and and you see these guys in these foxholes dug in and the mud. I mean, hard tanks pass. And holy shit! It's yeah. a it's a totally different kind of war. Um, but I asked him. I said, "We we want to be in a war with Russia." And he's like, "No, China. We're trying to get into a war because he thinks he's like we think we can beat China today, but we're not so sure we can beat China in five to seven years." I think China's fucked in about. 10 to 30 years, and I base that off of people smarter than myself, and their biggest issue that they're going to end up fighting is their population. Yeah. Um, I think, what is it, Peter Zion is how you say his last name? Is he the guy that Jack Carr had on? Probably, and he was recently on Rogan as well, and essentially, and again, I'm talking about this from a non-expert opinion, but their biggest threat is their one-child policy that they instituted for a really long time, and essentially to maintain a neutral population, uh, 2.1 kids per it might be per woman. Yeah. China's at like 0.6. Really? So, yeah. So there, and the U.S. right now is slightly above that. There are some countries that are doing okay. Um, there are some countries that are not doing okay. And China is at the top of that list. He, I believe, gave them, I don't want to say it was the end of this decade, but it is rapidly approaching where their population is going to take an absolute nosedive. So and it will be the biggest threat to China and will directly impact their ability to threaten anybody else in the world. Henry, what's you see like what the average age of people are in China and also in Russia? Because the guy that I'm thinking, and I'm not sure if it's the same guy or not, but Jack had a guy on that was super interesting. He wrote a book, I want to say it was eight, eight nine years ago, mm-hmm. and this guy had predicted when Russia would inv- invade re- Ukraine, and he predicted the year. And he nailed it. Exactly. And probably the same guy. He was talking about the age of was the book like the end of the world is not what you think it's going to be or something like that. I can't remember. Cause I totally messed that one up as well too. What do we got? That's China. Average age. 37. Pop, that says population of China. Population. Uh, oh, median, median age. 37. On the right. And then Russia is close. Russia's What's the United 30, States? What's the United States? Um, That actually seems younger than I would think. 38. That's interesting. Because China, because the way he was explaining it, and I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to know about those numbers just because. I would be too because I think if that has to be self-reported, then we there's an issue there for sure. Yeah. Because Russia, he was explaining with Russia and the reason that they were going into Ukraine when they were is that they would, and he he based it all off of population and age demographics. And the reason that they had to go was. We're talking about the same guy for sure. Yeah. they They didn't have. Um, they weren't going to have the youth on their side. The, the, the people from the old, um, from the Kremlin were dying off. And uh, with the spread of the internet and the age of the internet, the fact that they're, they're potentially even losing some of that like nationalistic feeling with their younger people. Um, we need to airdrop Starlink into these countries. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting with, uh, with Musk's internet if that's going to completely change the world, if people can get, well, they'd still have to get it. And those countries, I have a feeling that that might be a death sentence. For sure. If you were caught with one of those. Because you kind of have to mount those where they can be seen. I mean, there's <laughs> ways that you could get around it for sure, but those totalitarian regimes do not want you to have information outside of what they present to you. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder why. Yeah. It's exactly. almost like censorship. Yeah. Not a good idea. Well, and even China, with China running out of even um, just geographically room to live, you know, they're, they're with the population of that country. What's the split in China? What does it say for male to female population? Because they went deep on the, we need to have sons, not daughters. Yeah. I'd be curious. And I, I think it is the same guy we were listening to because that was on with Jack. Yeah, I think it's Peter's not. He was on uh, Rogan as well, too. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, 
but it's interesting in, interesting to me even the idea that you know we want to be in a war with China or that we would be trying to to get in a war with China and I don't know if that's a a cold war because the idea of there's no way those numbers are correct so also going back to here yeah, yeah. the median age has not changed which does of not, course not that doesn't make sense yes it does yeah. it, <laughs> it makes actually, it makes actually makes perfect sense also. yeah our median age is always 37 <laughs> 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 that's like it's pretty funny yeah okay cool yeah your population is growing only the population's grown but yet the age million. is the same that's fine the age that's is good. the same good. I'll, have, I'll have Glover check that math out yeah it's my quant so <laughs> yeah. you can borrow him as your quant he fucking sucks at math but he's spectacular at driving he's very confusing <laughs> that's funny well yeah it's it's uh but it's when he said that to me, it's actually an incredibly scary thing too. When you think about, cause like, like he said, he's like, well, do you want me fighting that war? Or do you want Hank fighting it? Cause Hank's five years away from fighting age. Four yeah, but years that's away. a shitty binary choice. That's an A or B choice. How about neither? Yeah. And that's what I said. I, I can't imagine that you can't get some smart people in the room and figure out how to beat them in a way that doesn't involve fucking nuclear war. I think in a lot of ways, with the restrictions that are put on both of those countries and the way that they are constrained, that's already happening. And they're getting to a place where they feel like the expression of violence through invading other countries is their only outlet. I mean, if they're already constricting, constricting, constrip, conscripting, wow, that was an amazing exploration of English. If, they, if Russia's already conscripting soldiers and they are defecting at a rate that it's even near where I'm hearing, like, they have a problem. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Now, mind you, in Ukraine, they're handing out AKs to grandmothers. Right. So it's not like they're well-suited to fight there either, but what they are doing is fucking fighting. Yeah. Which I would hope that the U.S. would do if we were ever presented with that situation. I have my doubts from time to time. But there's got to be... I don't like binary options when it comes to that. Is it, is it me or is it your son? It's like, how about neither... Yeah. How about we don't fight? How about we use that as the measure of absolute last resort? How about we work with a really large group of other people, and if we are going to fight, we fight equally instead of us going in there as a lion share and doing it? Which Well, if, if Ukraine was really that big a deal to the entire world, Germany, Great Britain, and everybody around them would be handling it. They're doing their best to stay out of it to the best of their ability. Yeah, yeah. And we're clearly, we're clearly trying to absolutely break russia economically which i would i would argue that's already like mission accomplished i mean they're hard to say right because just like the data that we're looking at you know median age 37 if you were to go to like the population in russia or the you know medium income be like two million dollars per person so you can't necessarily trust everything that you find on the internet yeah so i don't know i don't know the, the truth on the ground of how is their military actually doing how are they actually doing economically because we're just listening to what they tell us just like our own politicians, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah. Imagine though, when you when you look at how difficult it has been for Russia to advance across Ukraine and also hold territory. Imagine how difficult that would be in the country the size of the US and really Canada. I mean, you, you can basically say yep. US and Canada is gonna be one in that. Well, in the the book, if we're talking about the same guy, he talks about the it's luck. The topographical, uh, geographical makeup of the United States, we have an ocean, a huge ocean on both the east and west side. Yeah. We have an ally to the north and an ally except for the drug cartel to the south. It would be like we're, we're from a tactical perspective, we are better than pretty much anybody else in the world. Right. From pure dumb luck. There's nothing that we're doing about that. That's just the way that the chips fell. But yeah, it would be it would be extremely difficult for an enemy to try to make an invasion like that. And then especially when you look at how many weapons that there are spread across the United States in the citizens' hands. Um, I'm it, so sure a lot of them know how to use them, but, you know, yeah, there's a lot. Necessity is the mother of all invention, I guarantee you. Here's people, the problem. People would learn how to use them. I know a lot of people with a lot of guns and not much ammo. Not much ammo. Yeah. So great, great gun collection. Where's your bullets? Yeah, yeah, I think I got a box Some of nine mil over there. Like fancy that. clubs. It's like, oh, so what you're doing is holding my guns for me later on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, when you say, 
war was fun. What did you What did you like about war? Uh, it was like being on the highest performing team that you've ever heard of, and being able to successfully complete ridiculously challenging tasks night after night after night after night, and just watching that self, watching that situation or those teams or being involved in that and just feeling it play out was fucking awesome. Yeah. Did you ever, did you ever go out feeling like, uh, there was any, any chance of not, of not having success from the standpoint of what I mean, I guess is, is you mean like it, a tactical failure. Yeah. It just feels like we are, we were in that particular, uh, war though people can argue that we even, we ultimately didn't win it, um, is, you know, when you look at, like, Ukraine, Russia, and whatnot, it seems like it's just, like, one-on-one, you know, when when you look at what we were doing in the Middle East, it just seems like we were so far ahead. I mean, even just the fact that we have night vision. Um, when I when I wore some of that night vision, uh, we you know, we went and did a thing at Eberly Stock on their ranch, and I wore night vision, and I, it's, I'd never worn it before. Yeah. And there was, a, we were all camping in tents. And so, f- 800 yards away, 500 yards away, there was a bunch of tents set up, and we're wearing this night vision out on the shooting range, and I'm looking back towards camp, and you see all the little people walking around yeah. and all the stuff, and I thought to myself, this is the part where I could see where I'd be like, in, in, in a war situation, let's fucking go. Like, I want to go out every night, because it is so unbelievably lopsided. Um, it can be. We would, though, if you are looking at a, at least in my time in, and those two places in Iraq or Afghanistan, if we thought we were going to have a tactical failure, we wouldn't go. We yeah. would plan a different way to do it or go at a different time or approach it from a different angle. And by that, I mean like a planning angle, not like an actual azimuth on a compass that would give us the tactical advantage. If you go in and you think you're going to lose, you're that's not how you do that. That's not how you win. Um, it doesn't surprise me that Russia is having a hard time holding territory. Urban warfare fucking sucks. It's a 720 degree, you know, right? You know, 360 around you, 360 above you and below. Um, and then they're having to pass large sections of flat open area as well. Like th- those are challenges. Those are challenging problems. Um, night vision doesn't necessarily help you with that, especially when both parties have that. You know? Yeah. That, and that's what scares me is, you know, when I, when I think about a potential conflict with a country like China, not Russia, I mean, I clearly, I think, no one's at this point scared of Russia. They've proven they're they're not a worthy adversary. If we really wanted to do it for real, I wouldn't um, ignore them. It's certainly they haven't been able to live up to the claims that they had on how it was going to go. Yeah, but um, the idea of getting into something with a country like China is terrifying to me. And I don't know. I would say maybe what China doesn't have. Let's say that the tech is stacked even, right? Like it's from a technological perspective. Mm-hmm. What they don't have is 20 years of boots on the ground warfare, like our soldiers, sailors, Marines actually yeah. have. Yeah. The currency and competency of the modern day military, although it is waning because we have, uh, and it's a good thing, uh, you know, the world circumstances have gone away from that, but it makes a difference for isn't, sure. Isn't that interesting with the amount of conflicts that have gone on around the world in the last you know, hundred years or whatever that how little they've actually ever had, ever had boots on the ground anywhere. So I'm saying like you can have an awesome uh, fighter jet or you could have a, you know, this is our special forces battalion and they're yeah. really good at their drills. They've never been tested on field of battle. Stand the fuck by. Yeah. Not, not going to say that they're going to lose. What I'm saying is it's not the same and currency and competency counts. What do you think's happening with, all, all the balloon stuff that's happening now and whatnot. Do you think that's all, you know, I, I, mean, I, I always tend to question our own government and wonder like, is that China's balloon or are we testing stuff out? Or, you know, you hear Rogan talk a lot about, you know, commander Faber and all these different flying he's objects high all and the shit. Time. Joe's fucking bombed out of his mind half the time. <laughs> and then no, no, no judgment there whatsoever. He'd tell you that he is. <laughs> yeah. He'd be like, I'm talking out of my ass right now because I'm not sure if what we're actually doing in this room is real. But you see, you see what people, <laughs> Or or like our fighter pilots are saying they're seeing. What do you think all that is? I mean, so like the balloon that uh, floated over Montana, was it from China? Probably. But they also have satellite technology. So why would they need to float a balloon? 
you know, Glover thinks they were testing it so they could air release a nuclear weapon. I'm like, fuck you, Mike, for even bringing that up. So now I can think about that while sitting in my bed at night staring it's at the ceiling. It's funny because that's exactly what I said. Like, talk about a great way to just quietly float something in over the top of Times Square. I mean, maybe, but they also likely have intercontinental ballistic missiles that they could just program to go off in the air. You know, it's... People were up in arms like, China is spying on us. It's like, okay, listen, guys and gals. Can't leave the gals out. Or just say guys or gals in 2023. It's very, it's they very fluid. Very fluid. That shit confuses me. I'm sorry. And I, I, <laughs> it just confuses me. Um, we have satellite technology. Every single day we have satellites passing over Russia and China. They have satellites that are passing over us. The balloon. How dare say, them? We, exa- that's, and that's my point. It's like calm down yeah they are doing let's say it was a spy balloon real good job disguising it by the way fucking see the thing naked eye um (laughs) looking down at at montana uh boring like there's some cows and like a well the gophers and groundhogs are probably still hibernating but and a few nuclear sites sure but you could find they they know that are already all there you can find that shit on google i just put it on google they're all over around my buddy's ranch like we used to we got ran off by a couple of the guards a couple yeah. times because we were hunting coyotes out around them, and they were like, hey, kids. Uh, it's like an open secret. We I, may have been throwing rocks out onto it. Yeah, and I'm not saying that we, should, <laughs> we shouldn't we uh, should take something like that seriously, but let's look in the bigger picture. They're watching us. We're watching them. If the best tech they can use is a fucking helium-filled balloon, I'm not saying it's not problematic, but let's just look at it in the bigger picture. How dare they fly something over our country and look at us? Like, do you have any idea what we're doing in our own intelligence community? That's well, okay. That's what I. That's kind of what I said about uh, the week following Biden landing in the middle of a war zone in Ukraine. He then comes out and like warns and chastises the Chinese against like providing anything for Russia. And I was like, meanwhile, we're hundreds of billions dare, of dollars yeah. into providing arms, equipment, materiel to Ukraine. Yeah, it, I, I'm thinking to myself, how in the hell can we tell China not to send shit to Russia when we're sending billions of dollars of stuff to Ukraine and you fucking landed there? Like, it, it's it's just kind of funny when you look at um, the United States from a lens that's not from within the United States. It, it kind of looks ridiculous. I, I, I walked into a situation in Spain we were sitting at a coffee shop, not as nice as yours, but uh, it actually was attached to a castle now that I think about it. That's pretty dope. It was pretty dope. Uh, we were sitting there, and we got to talking to this guy. Well, he actually did a little translating for me because I couldn't speak Spanish, and we were trying to order stuff in this coffee shop. And this guy could hear it, and so then I was trying to ask questions, and my wife and I were debating this and then trying to talk to this gal, and finally this guy's like, hey, I can help you. And so he translates, super nice guy, young guy, probably 25, and uh, so gal goes away and we're talking and I was like, oh, where are you from? And he's like, oh, I'm from Argentina. And I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, where are you from? And I was like, oh, we're from America. And he goes, yeah, so am I. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he goes, yeah, South America. <laughs> he's like, that's what's funny about you guys in, you know, the United States of America. He's like, you think the only America is the United States of America. But he's like, there is North and South America. Yeah. We have a very myopic approach. And I was Generally, like, oh, I not mean, everybody. I, guess I hadn't really thought about it that way. Yeah, but we're, then not, we have, we're not the only inhabitants of this. I'm sorry to say this to some people: globe, ball flying through the universe. Yeah, but we ended up having kind of a laugh about it, and then you know, a great conversation. He was a great guy. But yeah. Um, yeah, when I look at our foreign policy and I see what's happening, but you know, I always the the thing that scares me most about our government back to just like government right left whatever is that when you see how incompetent we are in so many of the things that we handle internally that it really starts to make me worry from a national defense standpoint of like well if we're fucking things up this bad in our school systems and everything else that we're doing what makes us think that we're then all of a sudden doing foreign relations perfectly oh we're not for sure or even correctly at all 33 percent of the dod budget went missing in 2022 yeah, I think the numbers actually was thirty three percent. That's less than half. The recruiting numbers are at an all time low. They're wavering uh, things for all branches, from my understanding. I had a conversation with a uh, somebody who's in the recruiting world. Um, 
on the Navy Army or a Navy Marine Corps side of the house. And he's like, you wouldn't believe the stuff that we're accepting waivers for. And they're still falling short of their quotas. I saw a headline yesterday that the Army's kind of revamping the whole be all you can be slogan because of recruiting. They're trying to step up their marketing campaign to get. I don't know if marketing's going to do it. I think that one goes back to parenting as well. I think yeah. it goes back to raising your children with core values that are in line with what this country stands for. And of course, right after saying that, it's like, what does this country stand for? It really depends on. And, and quite it really f- depends on who you ask. Some people say, well, we're just the biggest oppressors, oppressors on the face of the planet. Um, you know, this country was founded on flawed ideology and blah, 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 blah. It's like, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I get, I get into uh, fairly, well, I try to avoid it generally politics, but I, I do get into debates where I still feel like we're the greatest country on earth. We're doing the most amount of good. You know, our system still has pr- produced the most, you know, how many Elon Musks are there from other countries? You know, I mean, we definitely seem to, our system, our capitalistic system definitely seems to breed some of the brightest and, and best, you know. It's um, certainly flawed, but I would ask people to show me a better example. Right. And if, as long as we're talking about human beings, it's always going to be flawed, right. especially when those people can find themselves in a position of power or monetary reward, which seems to be uh, sought after in equal regard, sometimes in combination by a lot of people. Um, but it's, I mean, you know, democracy is an experiment for sure. I think we're the longest running democracy at this point in the history of the world. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. You, you have sons that are of military age now. One's just under, but close. Yeah. And I have one just, just about there four years away, which is a flash of an eye. Um, any major conflict might last four years or, you know, yep. in Afghanistan or, you know, in the, in your guys's case, 20 years. Um, you know, that, what, what scares me the most is I've, I've raised very patriotic, pretty well educated kids about our government, how great our government is and also how flawed it is. You know, our government, I say our country, really our country. Um, but you know, seeing here as a parent, it's really hard to want to encourage a kid that's 18 to go into the military right now based on, and I'm not talking, this isn't a Joe Biden rant, rant. This is a right and left. When I say leadership of our government. Yeah. Um, to place my child's life in those people's hands right now. And and I don't know, like, is this just a feeling that all parents have in every generation? You know, Vietnam era. Um, it probably waned in the decades post-Vietnam, but as close as we are to the global war on terrorism and the fact that we're still actively involved in probably a good 40 countries throughout the globe, I mean, I think it's a more real thing. I would like to uh, see it a requirement, you know, if people in, in power in the political system are going to commit... American soldiers, men and women, cool. A member of your family has to go too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And what I would actually like, I think the biggest commitment that I want is we should always ask ourselves if we're going to go to war in any country, including Ukraine or where else, are we going to go there to win? Well, you're wasting your time if you go for any other reason. And, And in my opinion, in most of the conflicts we've had in the last 20 years, we haven't really gone to win. When I, I don't know if I they define. Win, I, I mean, don't know if they defined victory. Um, you'd have to let, let's use Ukraine as an example. Let's say Biden comes on and, he's, and he wants to sell it to the American people. Like, define for me victory, and if we achieve those wickets, what's the next move from there? Yeah, yeah. Because to me, victory is an absolute, complete stoppage of of the bullshit that's happening, whatever country that is. You know, and. Com- basically complete domination. I mean, look what, what we did in World War II. Where you, domination you just, for how long, though? How long do we stay? And and that and that to me is another thing where occupation to me is is generally, um, I, and I say it's a no go. But we still have bases in Germany and Japan and Korea. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we should have a base right now in Afghanistan. In my opinion, we should have Bagram Air Base. No matter. I agree. Even if we don't step out foot outside of that piece of property, just say, this is where we're going to have a base. Don't fuck with us. It was, I think, one of the biggest tactical mistakes made was giving up the Bagram airfield because another country will, at some point in time, take control of that. And Has. Probably. China. Yeah, yeah. they probably have. Um, and they'll use it for the exact strategic value and purpose that we could have used it for as well. Yeah, me and three relatively uneducated buddies of mine can look at a map and see 
uh, the relation of that particular piece of property to China and realize that that's probably a good a good little spot to have a base. Yeah. Especially with the trillions of dollars we dumped into building it and owning it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, th- th- those, those different tactical, um, th- the question, it's actually kind of amazing to me of like, we as a country, like, I think we should be able to vote right now on sending missiles and money to Ukraine. Like I haven't been asked. I haven't had a choice. You mean what's done with your taxpayer dollars? Yeah. That'd be pretty sweet to be able to at least see where it goes. Or eat, let's just start there. Can I see exactly where my taxpayer money is going? Is it going this year for whatever reason, my the last number of my social security that's going all going towards road infrastructure in the U.S.? I would actually be really happy to just start with that. Like, where did it go? Yeah. Then I think you could later on, where do you want it to go? Um, I would love to see somebody like Musk that has the wallet to do it to say... I'm going to sue the, sue the federal government. And once they finally show me where all of my money that I've paid them has gone and opened up their books entirely, I love. How I you will think then start paying taxes again. I love how you think that if they opened up their books, it would be anything other than a fucking bowl of spaghetti noodles. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even think that they could tell you where it went. No. And that is, of course, a massive problem in and of itself. Yeah. But yeah. Sue the government. They're like, yeah. Um, we were actually helping you could help us, Mr. Musk. Could you find some really smart people? And maybe you could tell us where the money went. Yeah. Um, imagine with the money that they've sent just to Ukraine, what they could have done to clean up LA or, you know, I don't know, an Ohio train wreck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it's actually kind of funny. It's, you know, a train wreck is exactly what we've got going on literally and figuratively, you know? Yeah. But who who in your life has been, this is something I've kind of wondered, um, you know, a lot of people look up to you with your podcast with... That's a mistake, by the way. Um, it's true. Uh, Aim higher. <laughs> uh, who's been, who's been like, whether it was growing up, and may, maybe two questions, growing up and then currently, who's someone you've always looked up to? Like, who, who was a hero of yours or who is? I mean, I definitely won the lottery with my parents. I mean, like straight, like lower middle class upbringing. Um, working with my, you know, my dad came from the construction field, largely he had military service on his side. My mom did a variety of administration uh, roles in, I mean, shit, she was part of startup. She was working in the tech world before like Silicon Valley was Silicon Valley, not as like a designer or anything like that, but on the administrative side. And then she ended up, writing, you know, getting into writing land grants and helping people write grants for, to preserve, uh, land before she died. So, um, but great parents, you know, I I definitely won the lottery with that. They set my moral compass, uh, really well early on in my life. And then I think the community that I worked in, I I left home shortly after turning 18, the community that I worked in refined that moral compass. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely point to my parents uh, when I was young, it gets a little bit more difficult in the SEAL community because I worked with a ton of awesome people and it would be hard to highlight, well, this, this exact thing I learned from this, you know what I mean? Like I can't yeah. really point exactly at it. I have a good examples of senior leaders. And I don't mean officers when I say that, even though there were some fantastic examples of officers, the most powerful examples of leadership I have were from senior enlisted leaders and in the Navy, that's the E7 to E9 realm, the chief, senior chief, master chief, petty officer. Uh, it's a combination of all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just, I I am aware of the fact that I'm wholly underprepared for most things that I do in life. And so I just approach it from a perspective of being curious and I try to ask questions and I just do the best that I can and ask as many questions as possible. Like, I don't know how to, build a coffee shop. So we went into the architects and we would ask questions. I would ask why, why do we do it like this? Why do we have to do that? What is this? What is, I mean, like, I'm not afraid to ask people questions like, excuse me, just so everybody knows I'm the dumbest person in the room. Can you please explain to me what this is? Um, and I think that's a, that's an attribute that we both share because a lot with what I'm doing today, like I didn't know how to run a, 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 a large production knife company, a, a manufacturing center. I mean, you could call it somewhat of a factory type setting, you know, like mm-hmm. um, had no idea, you know, how to do that. When I, when I went to, especially be, when you started, I mean, you were doing like small one-off custom stuff. Yeah. Like w- literally one knife a month. Yeah. Like 
more in the realm of what you would call art than any any level of production. That's fair. I mean, you posted a picture of that uh, folder that you made. Was that today you posted yeah. that? That thing's ridiculous. It's art for sure. Mm-hmm. So I, I think a lot of times people don't step out of their comfort zone and try stuff because they just, they say, well, I don't know how to do that. And um, it's awesome. Go figure it out. Yeah. And even, even with like with this podcast, you know, I, know I asked you questions and I've asked other people questions and followed some of the advice, you know, I didn't buy the right mic- microphones, I guess, but. It's always room for improvement. Yeah. Well, I hate to just go right into it and be better than you right off the bat. Why? I'd like Again, to kind of aim higher. The bar you. is super low. <laughs> if you trip over it, you weren't paying attention. Speaking of uh, knife making, forging stuff, um, are you wearing your ring? So we made, uh, it's pretty cool. We should, we should get a couple pictures of it. I still have never sanded down the inside edge, though, because when we put it in the acid. The, is it still a little rough? It's not rough. It's just you can see the gold peeking out on the side. Yeah. Remember when I said I was going to do it? I think I lied to you about that. We could hit it on the uh, the disc sander before you leave. I don't know what that is. It's uh, it'll it'll work. Is it a sander that looks like that, a or disc? you can just quit being? I mean, you're kind of like it doesn't soft, bother me. Like soft podcast hands no, these days. You'll see what I mean. Look at it. Hold it up and look at the edge. You'll see that it was perfect as we sanded it down. But oh, then yeah. we put it into the acid, which correct me if I'm wrong, removes a little bit of the metal. It does. Yeah. So then, yeah. Well, your years of watching Forge and Fire have made you clearly an expert. Yes. Um. No, we we made this ring. This is uh that was that was a huge honor for me. It actually it looks it looks good. Yeah, it looks great. Um got an 18 karat gold band in the middle of it. Um you know, people who make It was Damascus. You let me make the Damascus and you would step in. We're like, "Oh, that was a little bit too much." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um you just add flux. I know that from the uh Forge and Fire days. Has it has just it like discolored this. your finger at all? Has it been good? No, that's why we put the gold on the inside. Well, and that's what I, that's why I was asking. Yeah, if, no, if not at all. Not a single bit. Yeah, because people who make metal rings, Damascus rings, you know, that steel's not stainless, so it'll it'll tend to discolor uh, your finger, but that gold on gold on the on the skin contact. I've never, I've never noticed a single bit of discoloration. But that was cool. That was uh, one of the cooler experiences. I mean, being able to be kind of a part of your guys' you know, day and stuff like that with your wedding and whatnot, making that ring was cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I never thought I was going to, you know, get the chance to make it. For clarity, you did 94.3%. I'm <laughs> 93, probably, not 94. Yeah. Uh, Even when I was there, like, making the Damascus, you're like, yes, well, right here. Well, with your busy <laughs> schedule, it definitely turned into, like, I was like. We did it in two runs. We made the yeah. the steel first, and then, yeah, I came made back to it. Yeah. And then, so Andy gives me his ring size. Like, all right, you're a, I think it was a 10 or something like it that. It was. Give me, a, all right, you're a 10. I got my little ring gauge out and I had more than enough gold. But I was like, all right, he says he's a 10. I have this little ring gauging and I've only made one or two rings and I've never had to make one. Uh, I've always had the what, one or two I've made like the finger there to yeah. size it as I was doing it. Well, I was trying to make sure we had this thing done. I was starting I to I swear we sized, we used your ring size guy. I swear we used it. Bef- no, I think we, we did, billet. but when you, those ring sizing gauges that you actually put the ring on are like, it's like, well, because they're tapered. So it's yeah. like, well, is a 10 this side of the ring or that side of the ring? And by the time you slide it a whole ring width one way or the other, you've just lost a size or gained a size. Just say it's not laser measured. It's not. So <laughs> I have this nice piece of gold. And I cut this piece of gold to length and I turn it, I get it all round. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to just wait to solder it together till Andy gets here, but I just double check size, but I'm sure it's fine. And Andy gets here and we put it on his finger and it's like not even close. I'd say quarter inch, quarter inch. Yeah. Like not even, I don't still don't understand what happened. I don't either. And I don't know if I hit it well, but I was shitting myself. Cause I'm like, what? I'm going to be the reason this wedding can't even happen. No, we just, I would have worn it without the gold and like handed it back to you after the yeah. ceremony. Like, so Good God, man, all problems have solutions. We had to solder a. Uh, I like how you use ex- the term "we" an extension, <laughs> <laughs> as if I did anything. <laughs> one of my and what, while I was soldering the gold for that, one I had no more gold, so th- this w- had to work. And two, the biggest failure in my knife making career. Oh, oh, that's right, was with gold. Was soldering gold, and I ruined about six thousand dollars worth of gold uh, in the time it takes you to blink. Because when you're heating God gold, damn. it goes from red hot to uh, lava in about a two degree swing. And so while we, while we were heating that and I was soldering, I was shitting myself. But uh, it all worked out fine. Yeah. 
So basically all I did was sand, sand it down to the circular pattern. And I think you did the rest. Yeah. Well, we, we, we were definitely in a time crunch to where I didn't really want to put it too much of a chance of, of failure. No, it's been awesome. So, yeah. So last thing I want to talk to you about, you just did the triple seven. Yes. Um, you posted a photo just a day or two ago of like a shadow over the top of the pyramids. Um, that was a shadow of the pyramid. The canopy was like right over the top of the pyramid. Okay. Yep. It was, and I'm, and it was funny what you wrote on there about how you, you for a second you thought about landing on 100% the pyramid, true which story. I actually kind of lost a fair amount of respect for you for not doing that. Um, the only reason I didn't is I knew it would have become an international incident and I didn't, I couldn't in the very fleeting moment decide whether or not it would be international incident Good press, international incident, bad press. I think you were, ultimately, I think could have raised more money, but you might have had to spend Simon in an Egyptian jail. Or they could have just basically grabbed the whole team and not let us continue. It's true, yeah. That was the biggest thing. I was about 30 yards from the top of that pyramid. How, because uh, I would think with where you guys jumped, I would actually think other places would be more scenic as far as like, I, I wouldn't have actually pyramids? thought. Yeah, I wouldn't have actually thought just because it's all kind of sand and desert and stuff. But then when you start thinking about the size of those pyramids, it makes sense because you've you've said a, a few times that that was the coolest jump you've ever had. Hundred percent by far. Um, and Arctica was unique because of how challenging it was or restrictive it was to actually get there. But it looked like snow topped a mountain range, which is cool. Don't get me wrong; it was awesome. But looking down over the top of the three pyramids like i don't know how i don't know what else you would jump over that could replicate that H- had you ever been to the pyramids before uh-uh. did you guys get to well you were in such a hurry you probably did we but- did go to the pyramids early that morning and we walked through the area where we were going to land which was a golf course right adjacent to it and they have a golf course there yeah i don't think it was actually in use though but it was definitely it used to be a golf course i i don't know how recently it's been shut down but it, that's certainly what it was uh, so we looked at the landing area and we could see the pyramids in the distance, but we did not go like walk around the actual pyramids. Oh. How how wild are those? Uh, it's got to be unbelievable as you're flying down over the top of those, looking at those things. That's why it's the most memorable jump yeah. for sure. It, it's super, I mean, the pictures don't really capture the size and scale. Yeah. They're fucking huge. Yeah. And... At a distance, they look smooth, and then you get closer. I'm like, oh, my God, like they're falling apart, which given how long they've been there and obviously made by the aliens, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's like, oh, yeah, those things have been around for thousands of years, so they're falling apart. Um, but there's no relative size of scale. So we, we were able to see it from the golf course and looking at them and then to see it from above under canopy just flying around. I'm like, what is going on right now? Yeah. It was wild. What was the most difficult part of that? whole experience was it the travel the planning before and putting together all of the potential options we got the number one reason why we were able to accomplish it so the goal was seven jumps seven continents in seven days to try to raise seven million that part was impossible to begin with and i was always really open with mike about that we ended up doing seven jumps seven continents in six days six hours somebody said six minutes to me that's far too convenient i don't think that was actually the case but it was in the six day mark so we were able to do it even faster than we wanted to. And the reality is we got super lucky. We didn't miss any flights. We didn't lose any bags. You all flew commercial, right? We flew commercial except for one leg. We landed in Miami and the FAA NOTAM system shut down. So we had an overnight flight, a red eye from Santiago, Chile to Miami. And was had, that was that when they, in the morning, they shut down the entire country? I think that correct. was like Hun Expo or something. And, um, that's the day that we landed in Miami. That's so right. We were driving up to the drop zone in Clewiston, Florida, and we all kind of got the same email at the same time from American Airlines. Hello, dear sir or madam. Yeah. Your flight is no longer flight. <laughs> yeah. So we uh, we got up there. So you flew a private for that? We sourced a jet for one leg. And we, they were allowing, I wasn't sure if correct. they were even, I didn't know they were allowing private travel at that time. Well, it was departing from the U.S. and going straight to Barcelona. I mean, but basically... There was uh, like Miami, and then we took off from a smaller airport, maybe 15 miles to the north. We landed, I think, within 20 or 30 minutes of when we were supposed to on our commercial flight. But it was that was the biggest hurdle that we encountered. And had we not been able to do that, holy shit, it would have been. I mean, it's tough enough changing one airplane ticket. Like, yeah. 
oh, hey, American Airlines, do you have 14 open seats on tomorrow's flight? Right. It would have turned into an absolute shit show. We were able to solve that problem, though, in like 45 minutes. That's that's impressive. Did the jump, hung out for a little bit, packed up. That's where everybody shed their uh, gear from Antarctica, so we were able to hand a lot of that off. I was carry-on only from that part for the rest of the trip. Um, I had a backpack and I had a, an OGO roller bag that had all of my stuff in it, which was awesome. Cause I didn't, I was, my biggest thing was, I don't want to check these bags. If I lose my parachute, like that kind of sucks. Yeah. Now I guess I can jump once, but not twice. Um, but the planning, we, it was like 18 months of planning, looking at, you know, our first stab at the air travel was, I want to say it was 135 hours in commercial flights. And then we just kept refining it until I think it landed between 60 to 70 hours on commercial flights. Hmm. And we looked at going west first. We looked at going east first. Then you have to find drop zones that are near the airports. Then you have to reach out and like some, you know, visas and permit. Can we fly a drone? Like all of this stuff that goes into that yeah. that you would never think about. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Permits in almost all the locations. Like the Australias have their, uh, Australias. Australia has their own uh, parachute federation. So we had to do a bunch of paperwork for them. Nick, our tandem master, had to sit down with one of their tandem master examiners and do a written and a verbal test. Um, oh shit! Yeah, they're just you. You would think with your guys' level of experience that there'd be a. They don't care, and that's fair. They they shouldn't yeah. care. Yeah. Um, if that's the way that they said it, then that's the way that they said it, and we we plan for that. We're like, okay, we got to get here like an hour early. Mm -hmm. Um, we had to think about what happens if somebody has a malfunction. Do we have a rigger that can repack it? What do we do if somebody gets hurt? Right. What do we do if somebody dies? Right. We, we thought through all of those things. Yeah. And obviously, if, if I was the one who was died, they would stop everything. <laughs> if it was anybody else, we would continue on on their honor. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's... it's It was it's, a lot. Yeah. That's... It's a ton... That's a ton of... A ton of effort, like the logistics, for sure. The jumping... Are you, are you going to jump? The jumping was super easy. Yeah. Gra gravity works on all seven continents. I hate to report to people, there is no ice wall. So, is the world... Did you, could you tell, is the world actually flat then or is it round? What I've determined is it doesn't matter whether or not I've seen it with my own eyes. Yeah. Uh, people are going to believe what they want to believe. Okay. And so are best you, of luck with are that. you going to continue? So like with the wingsuit stuff, are you going to continue jumping and get back into wingsuits or are you kind of? I mean, maybe. I don't think I'll ever base jump a wingsuit again, but skydiving, like I could throw, I have a dozen wingsuits in my house. I could throw one on my parachute system and jump out of an airplane and it would be just fine. I don't think I'll ever walk up to the edge of a cliff and send send that again. Maybe. I don't know. What's I mean, what was the world record? Explain what you did with the with the wingsuit. Was that at So that altitude? was out of a plane. It was it was was no, it was not the highest altitude because the previous record holder went down, I believe it was to Columbia and got a multi engine aircraft which allowed them to go higher. And at some point you're limited by the airframe. Like, hey, this is as high as we can go. Like, cool, Roger that. So I got out at thirty six thousand five hundred feet. I was hyper current in a wingsuit at that time because I knew that that was coming up for months. So that's basically the only jumping that I was doing. And the record at the time was, it was two records. It was uh, distance from exit to deploying a parachute. That was one record. And then distance from exit, deploy the parachute. And then the additional uh, distance that you travel under canopy as well. Wow. Yeah. That's a... Uh... So did, and did you have somebody jump out with you like cameraman? No. I mean, you got to think about it to get an aircraft that high, like you, there are minimum personnel. So there was a pilot, there was an oxygen tech, myself and a huge aviator bottle of oxygen and a, and a, a console that goes from the bottle to the console to me. What's the temperature when you jump out? It was like negative 50. No shit. Yeah. So it's like an average day in Haver. I don't know where Haver is. Haver, Montana. Just on the other, directly on the other side of the mountains from you, up north of Browning. I don't go there. It's not a place you want to go. That's exactly why I don't go there. Yeah. And really, probably same wind speed on an average day in Haver as like when the doors are open on a plane. That's the deal outside of the little banana belt that we're in, right? Like the wind just whips a lot more. Like we don't get a whole lot of that. I feel like it goes, they're not mountains. Somebody was describing them the other day, looking west and Cal. Look at these mountains. I was like, those I think are hills, sir. But it's enough topography for it to go up and then over the mountain range to the east. From what I've heard, I've heard horror stories. And then of it like, gets it on. I've heard horror stories of Great Falls in the wintertime, just ripping through. Well, you've you've tried to survive a night in a Walton and that stuff. I mean, that's basically the same wind. Emphasis on tried. Yeah. That Walton tried is and failed. no longer in service. <laughs> yeah. That's the same as putting a sail up 
on a sh- sailing vessel in like a hurricane force winds. Where were des- wall tents designed not to use uh, exactly where you tried to use it? Well, we did try to put it <laughs> on like the rounded top of the hill. Yeah. Because if you're going to go... Go, go, go big. Go big. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and also, you know, it's really cool with the uh, inreaches. They give you a weather alert, and we all got one, and we're just like, yeah, that's probably wrong. <laughs> yeah, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so if, when, you're, when you're an old man someday, what... Like right now? Yeah, well, when you look older, um, what are you going to be, like, with your grandkids, what, what are you most proud of? Like, what thing... Because you've done... You've done more things. I mean, and we've we've skipped across. We could do a five hour podcast here, but you know, private pilot's license, jet license, worked for CrossFit, um, Navy SEAL podcasts, very successful podcasts. I don't know where it ranks, not that it matters, but it's up I there. I don't either. Um, you know, wingsuit jumping, um, everything that you've done, what are you most proud of? My kids. I mean, I don't think any of that other stuff really matters. I mean, I think if it can go, if I think if it goes on a business card or a resume, it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. I think the stuff that you never think to put on those business cards and resumes, because they don't, they don't make sense in that world. Like, have you ever received a resume where somebody led with three kids who are a positive contribution to society? <laughs> they probably wouldn't <laughs> get the job, like, right? Because it, it doesn't make sense in that environment, yeah. but that's how from a professional perspective that's how we rack and stack ourselves i'd rather get that than several of the ones i've been getting late lately start with they them which throws me completely for a loop from uh the get-go it's like i can't read what's after it in enough time i think that concept is gonna the snake is gonna eat its tail on that one i think they're their own worst enemy not to get totally off track, but yeah. I did I did see an article out that they've done a study and people who lead with their on their resumes with they them aren't getting jobs as a higher rate as people that don't. It's kind of shocking. Except for the fact it's not shocking. Exactly. Yeah. So back to your accomplishments. Um, but, you, you know, so the resume thing, that's how we measure ourselves in the business world. And then a business card, it's like, well, I got to I need to get some. Uh, acronyms and abbreviations because that's what people want right yeah phd md whatever the fuck people put on those things there i think those are awesome i think those are accomplishments people that should be very proud of but if you're asking me what i value the most it's it's none of those things i don't give a shit about any of that stuff i want to see my kids continue to evolve into critical thinking objective solid human beings like at the end of the day, that's that's all I want. Parenting, from my experience with four kids, is definitely it's the most challenging thing I've ever oh, done. Oh, for sure. Um, and probably where I've it's interesting. I have what I consider I'm, I'm biased, but they are great. I have four really great. Hey, your kids, kids are awesome. But it's also the place that I've probably experienced the most failure. Yeah, because you're not really in control of the situation all the way through. Um, as soon have, as they start going to school, your impact on them decreases every day. Yeah. Their social circle and teachers especially as they start getting older and they start getting jobs. I mean, the number of usable hours that I have with my children every day. I mean, my middle son lives with us and it's at best an hour or two per day that I'll see him because he is up yeah. and out and doing his own shit. Well, and there's, there's other influences in their lives that, you know, they've got a mom, uh, you know, we're in a similar situation from the standpoint that we're divorced and yep. now you got the stepmom situation in there. Um, and that you also start trying to do that job, the most important job you're ever going to do when you're an idiot when you're young. I mean, you know, it's interesting. Like when I look back, um, and, and again, I think I've done overall in totality, a pretty good job, but like, man, if, if you could have the experience that you'd need starting out the things that you would do different, you know, the ways you would change it potentially. That have being some more said, kids, you know, have a talk with Jess and just be like, Hey, let's go ahead and ruin our lives and have uh, small children. We've discussed it. Um, don't and do it. That's a hard no. I'll never talk to you again. If you do that. If they would come out like four. Teen? Yeah, I could go with four or five. <laughs> if they would just come out old enough to put shoes on and get in the car. Like, hey, get your shit. Let's go. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be all for it. I mean, I have a blast when they're seven or eight and they're starting into Little League and doing all their little yeah, things. And now you're hunting with them and doing. I remember the day my sons came up to me and said, Dad, we want to get dirt bikes. And I said, you need to go say that in front of your mom. Yeah. Because I can't say those things. But if you do, Daddy's getting a dirt bike too. Yeah. 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 It, it, that's like the day that you realize like, oh, you just became my best friend. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, but I, it changes over time. I mean, it's, I don't, I think you can be friends with your kids, but you should never stop being their parent. hundred percent. And I think uh, some people err far too, I think you can actually take either side of that too far. Yep. It's a balance. Um, I definitely want to be my kids' friends, but they'll never forget that I'm, I'm their parent. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree with that. And, and that's an interesting line to walk. Um, and it's, it's an, it's an adjusting line. I found, you know, having gone through having a kid that's now 18, how I'm parenting a 16 year old and a 14 and a 12, you know, it's definitely an interesting adjustment, but, um, you know, you, you want to be enough of a friend that you really do want them to come and talk to you when they need to. But not so much of a parent that they are afraid to come talk to you. Yeah. 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 And and we've seen here lately, I mean, we just lost a, a kid in Frenchtown, you know, two, two, three months ago to suicide, you know, and uh, it sounds like the kid got, I don't know if catfished is the right situation, but basically tricked online. Like, um, I think he sent some pictures he shouldn't have to what he thought was a girl, but instead it was an internet, you know, uh, predator. Yeah. That then turned around and started blackmailing him and literally wanted 20 bucks. And it, from, from the story I understand might not be exactly right. He had gotten 18 bucks together, was a couple bucks short, asked a friend for two bucks. Kid said, ah, fuck off. Didn't know the situation. And, you know, kid went out and committed suicide. Um, I'm very glad that those tools were not available to me when I was growing up. And by that, I mean smartphones and the internet. Oh, the, the, the amount of responsibility is as much as people kind of talk about, you know, kids these days, you know, and you hear the, oh, kids these, these days, the amount of responsibility they have compared to what you and I had. I mean, the power of the internet, the power of a camera, you know, everything. I mean, holy shit. I mean, to look I'd have at, been looking at some, titties. to look at boobies when you were 14, mm-hmm. like you, you had to do some work to my f- search history. If I'd had that when I was 14, you'd had to wash your eyes with bleach. It's quite amazing that kids these days handle it like so well. Yeah. Well, they were, they were born media, with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible. But, um, well, with, with, with your accomplishments, what, what's left that you, like, what's your next big thing that you want to kind of go after? I mean, you've built this mm. epic coffee shop. Um, I think I just want to do more of what I'm already doing. Yeah. I mean, I think if we can prove the business model on a brick and mortar coffee shop, I think there's some interesting ways that we could do like a smaller expression of that and take more of a geographic approach to it. Um, right now it's the only black rifle coffee in Montana, but why not make it one of, you know, one, I don't know how many, Mm -hmm. again, not necessarily brick and mortar. Um, maybe it's a drive-through model. Maybe it's a pop-up model. I don't know. Um, I I think with what, with what you built there, I think you're going to end up seeing that um, potentially emulated by some other people, probably with black rifle around the country. Yeah. Um, I hope so. I, I, I hope so. Cause if, if you do, that means it's successful, but, uh, I, I could take that same structure and place that in, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth or oh, San Antonio crush. or yeah. wherever. I mean, you name it all over the country. Um, and it would crush. Yeah. I think, you know, the easiest way to answer that question is I want to do more of what I'm already doing now, but still make sure that I keep enough time for myself. It's really, you know, not that I don't care about money. I certainly like money just like everybody else does. But to me, the definition of wealth is not a number in an account. It's the ability to do what you want to do with your time. Like I want to travel with my wife this month, largely to jujitsu stuff to support her and also participate because I love doing it as well. It's really cool that you guys do that. I was talking to Denver and, um, you know, we're having a get together here in a couple of weeks and you guys aren't going to be at it. And, you know, we were talking at your grand opening about the fact that, you know, Denver and Erica are going. Yep. Uh, and like he said, pretty much anywhere she goes to teach, we go just to support her, which yeah, is same thing. Super cool. Um, yeah, we're going back to Costa Rica for another jujitsu camp, taking my son with us in April, I think it is. Uh, but yeah, more of the same stuff that I'm doing, but just try to continue to be smarter about it and always make sure that I'm buffering my time. Yeah. Is there a, Last question for you. Is there an ultimate kind of guest on your podcast? Is there somebody you've tried to get, somebody you'd really like to talk to? Um, I would like to talk probably to Bush, the president. I'd be fascinated to actually pin him down and talk with him about 
Iraq and Afghanistan and if, the decisions that were actually made around it. If you could actually give them truth serum and get real answers. I feel like at some point in time, their bucket of fucks is empty and they would give you real answers. Yeah. You know? That's not one that I would have thought about, but it's with your experience and with... Well, that's what I would have... Want. I mean, he made decisions from an office room, for lack of a better term, that had a huge impact on a lot of men and women and the trajectory of our country and the tra- trajectory of a generation of men and women. I'd be fascinated to know how he thought about it. Does it still wear on him? What regrets? What would he change? What would he do differently? Like all those questions. It's interesting because he came across... Uh, to me as just a regular civilian, as a good guy. Like, he came across as, you know, this, he played this, like, I'm a simple guy, I'm just kind of a, you know, rancher that wears a hat, you know, blah, 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 but, you know, I'm a good old boy, but he came across, him and Laura Bush came across as, like, just good people. But then ultimately, you just wonder the decisions that were made in looking back on all of it, and how much of it was he duped by advisors, people, you know, Cheney and Cheney certainly had an agenda. Rumsfeld and yeah. all those people. Yeah. They, um, th- to say that they didn't have an agenda would be to ignore like objective reality. And again, I think at some point in time in their life, they would probably want to sit down and have that conversation. I mean, they're just people. Yeah, yeah. You had a really, really unique and bizarre job, but you're just a person. I keep waiting at some point. Those people are getting old enough that is there going to be a book that comes out that actually lays a lot of it out like you know from a know. financial perspective somebody stands to gain financially quite well to just do a tell it all yeah. you know um but uh yeah that's an interesting one um how how is your what's your ultimate feeling of you know the whole Iraq war Afghanistan you know I've I've had veterans here that absolutely believe like ah, you know, we went and did our best. I believe in what we did and it doesn't really bother him too much. And then I've had a couple guys here um, that I'm, you know, friendly with that we had at our veterans event that, um, you know, are, are borderline suicidal from all of it and question the why and, you know, feel like they lost or feel like our government gave up on them and, you know, was the sacrifice worth it? Worth it? You know, the boots on the ground, people shouldn't worry too much about the why because we never were in control of the why. Mm-hmm. We did the best that we could in both of those uh, theaters of war, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and at the end of the day, the geopolitical decisions that were made were so far removed from somebody who has actually had their boots on the ground. So I think people should be proud of the effort that they put in and that the people who made the decisions, you know, I think we went into Afghanistan for a far more righteous reason than we went into Iraq. Um but again, I, did, I had no control over that. I My job was my job, and I did it to the best of my ability, and I'm sure those people did as well. If they didn't have their hands on the steering wheel of the why, they shouldn't waste too much time, you know, Yeah. concerned about whether or not what they did is important. Because what they did was important at a much more tactical level. They had no control over the larger, you know, mechanism that is the U.S. military and national defense policy. You know, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a guy that put it to me this way, and it was super, it made a lot of sense to me, uh, and, and I, was tr- I was trying to put myself in the position that maybe you would be in, or like Andrew, my director of ops that was there, and p- different people. He said, he's like, I feel great about what I did. He goes, I helped provide an entire generation of humans freedom for an entire, you know, for 20 years, for an entire generation, like, a, a child my daughter's age, Demi, who is 18, mm-hmm. about to be 19, literally grew up relatively free and got to go to school for 20 years. And that's not a small impact. Like, th- the impact of that actually, I think, is still two generations from now to be seen of, uh, you know, is there a coup someday? Is there prog- you know progressive values that come out of that? That is there an uprising in another 10 years after oppression happens that, all those people that are 15 to 25 today when they're 35 to 50, you know, um, it'll take time. Yeah. So that made a lot of sense to me that, you know, you affected a generation of, you know, millions of people in a super positive way, you know? Yeah. So they got, they got to see what freedom looks like. 
as as free as they're going to probably ever be anyway. And that was our job. And the people who had their hands on the wheel need to be held accountable for the direction that they pointed the ship. Which now they just turn around and pointed the ship at a different place that we kind of question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> remains is, to be seen what will yeah. happen there. Well, thanks. Yeah, man. I appreciate you coming down. Cool. Back on the road up to Kalispell. All right. All right.